delighted to be here because uh, this is a very special occasion. And I would like to, of course, thank the president of ICANN, uh, our very own uh, Alaji Yayola, if you forgive my Kwara Parako also. Um, uh, may I also uh, acknowledge and thank the uh, conference chairman uh, and the panelists who will be leading us in the discussion today, the, first, the very first panel, um, and also to welcome and thank all of you uh, for being here for this very important occasion, the 48th Annual Accountants Conference. Title, Securing Our Shared Future, Our Collective Responsibility. It's impossible for any individual or group of people to address the challenges of a country and certainly the challenges of building the nation and building the economy. Now, coming to accountants. Somehow, some people think accountants should be about micro aspect of the economy, how to manage the books. But there can be no micro economy without a macro economy. It has to be in the context of what it is that we're about to do. How is it, how is wealth created, by whom, and how is it managed and for whom? And that is why I think it is very important that we listen very carefully, very attentively to what uh, the lead presenter is going to say today and also the discussant. Because it is very true that we have to move away from obsession with sharing the national cake. We have to move to how to produce well, or to put it more simply, how to increase the national cake rather than how to share it. Also, we have to look at the role of chartered accountants beyond even the private sector, because there can be no private sector without a public sector. And accountants have responsibilities not only to the private sector, but also they have a public interest and mandate. My job as chairman is not to give you another lecture. Rather, we have the experts. And I'm going to shortly be calling on the lead presenter, Ms. Rachel Grimes, who is IFAC uh, president. A lady of substance, many decades of experience, which is going to share with us particularly because in many ways we live in a global village and we have to be constantly reminded that much as we Nigeria think we are the world, we are not. We are not even center of the world, we are part of the world. Also, the global economy is changing and therefore we have to respond appropriately to the changing dynamics of production, of exchange, of services. I'm also delighted to be sharing the, the, uh, the podium today with uh, the other discussant, Mr. Kunle Lebuti, FCA, who is the National Senior Partner and Chairman of KPMG in Africa. I think between them, we are going to have a very good start to this uh, 48th annual uh, conference and to, to, to set the pace and to point the way so that at the end of this conference we will not just be um, sharing experiences, sharing ideas, but really contributing to moving the accountancy profession forward, moving the national economy forward, and, and contributing positively to the global economy. So with these few remarks, uh, you are very welcome, and I will now call on the lead uh, presenter Presenter Ms. Rachel Grimes to lead the discussion. Over to you. ICANN President, member of ICANN Presidency, revered past presidents of ICANN, members of the ICANN Governing Council, 
to my fellow board member, my fellow IPAC board member, the General, uh, fellows and associates of ICANN, my fellow panellists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. For those of you who don't know, my IFAC role is voluntary. My day-to-day -day role is that of the CFO of Technology Transformation and Operations at Westpac, Australia's oldest company. We turned 201 years of age in April this year. We are the second largest bank and at the moment the third largest company by capital. <coughs> So in this role, I feel that there's a fabulous intersection of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis as my IFAC presidency role and my day-to-day -day role. And it's been a privilege to represent the three million accountants around the world, and I believe that 5,000 of them are in this room. So I'm thrilled to be able to see so many of you all. Thank you. <laughs> but I do believe it is a unique position as the intersection of technology-led transformation taking place in business and society. With this in mind, the global and the local, I'm very excited to explore the theme today of, of securing our shared future, a collective responsibility. The theme underscores two very important points. Accountants have great skills to positively influence the future, and we can't secure the future alone. We must seek out and work with others who share our commitment to the public interest and a stronger global economy and society. In my time with you today, I want to share IFAC's global perspective and show how it supports the Pan-African and ICANN programs and to demonstrate that with our combined efforts, the accountancy profession has bold thinking and solutions to answer some of the most challenging issues of our time. First, a little about IFAC's global strategy. <clears throat> Around the world, there is widely identified trust crisis. Broadly, citizens have lost faith in their governing institutions. That's why Build Trust, Inspire Confidence is the title of IFAC's strategic plan for 2019 2020, and that's what IFAC, our member organisations, and their member bodies and their members do every day. The vision for IFAC is that global accountancy profession is essential for strong, sustainable organisations, financial markets and economies. We aim to achieve this through three key strategic objectives. The first, to contribute to and promote the development, adoption and implementation of high quality international standards. Secondly, to prepare a future ready profession. And finally, speak out, be the global voice for the profession. Why do we focus on global standards? Because it serves the public interest when high quality audit and assurance ethics, education and public sector accounting standards are adopted globally. People often ask me why did I become involved in IFAC <clears throat> and the truth is that I was in mergers and acquisitions for many years in Australia and as we looked to invest globally I often was presented with the question what set of accounts do you want? I found this quite unusual I said, what are my choices? They said, well, you can have the management accounts, the statutory accounts, the tax accounts. And I looked and I said, can I have the family accounts? And they said, no. <clears throat> so that's why. Because I fundamentally believe with high quality standards that the flow of capital will go to where it's needed most. The governance of that, the approval of that, will get to people far more quickly. And I hope that many other people have the opportunity to work for a wonderful organisation like I do. Why focus on a future-ready profession? Because disruptive technology-driven change is underway. To building trust and inspire confidence, current and future accountants must have the right mix of skills and competencies and demonstrate the highest standards of ethical conduct. 
And in the bank that I work for, I see this every day, we just implemented eight lots of robotics. And I did not want there to be any changes in the amount of full-time employment that we had, full-time employees. Rather, I saw it as an opportunity for accountants to embrace technology and make their lives better. And the morale of our finance team has gone up as the more mundane compliance side of their job has been removed and they can spend time doing what accountants do best and advising and being the trusted advisor. And finally, why focus on speaking out? Because professional accountants are the defenders of public interest. In a low trust environment, the public must know how that accountancy profession is on their side. And here in Nigeria, I can as an example of what that means in practice. I hope you have all read the lead paper for this session. Here's a quote from it. The Nigerian nation is a richly endowed with human and natural resources which have not been optimally leveraged to achieve sustainable development. Yes, the lead paper correctly identifies sustainability as a vital issue. It's the issue of our generation. For all who follow us, and accountants have a positive contribution to make. At the global level, IFAX is supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we specifically identified eight goals as being particularly suited to the profession's skills and work. These include quality education, gender equality, peace, justice and strong institutions, and decent work. Technology will help with that. We should not fear that. We should embrace it. We should own it. And ethics will be a fundamental contribution to where robotics and where artificial intelligence and where technology goes in the future. And ethics underpins our very profession. We have the skills to make this happen. The lead paper identifies Nigeria's human environmental wealth. Along with the four other forms of capital, IFAC shares your belief that they must be accounted for. This is why IFAC supports the work of the International Integrated Reporting Council. Integrated reporting is a bold, innovative response to a fragmented, complex and largely compliance-driven global financial reporting system. In our G20 call to action, we will explicitly call for the adoption of the International Integrated Reporting Framework. Doing so will help improve our corporate decision making towards measures and thinking needed to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. At the regional level, I was privileged to attend last year's African Congress of Accountants in Uganda. Integrated thinking was high on the list of priorities and remains a key strategic objective of the Pan-African Federation of Accountants, or PARPA. While there, I also attended the PARPA General Assembly. PARPA's strategic plan, building a bridge to a brighter Africa, remains both ambitious and supportive of the continent's accountants. And PARPA's Integrated Reporting Committee provides strategic direction to support the growth of integrated thinking and reporting right across your beautiful continent. Nationally, ICANN's role in preparing accountant support to support the Sustainable Development Goals has been outstanding and consistent. ICANN is no stranger to the long-term solutions that are needed to solve the SDG challenge. IFAC stands for ICANN in its advocacy for good governance, accountability and sustainability. I also commend ICANN for its practical training programs. I've reviewed these and I saw that there was a two-day course on corporate reporting and sustainable development goals coming up. It starts on the 31st of October and ends on the 1st of November, which will mean that you have just enough time to get on the plane to come to Sydney for the World Congress of Accountants. And I look forward to welcoming you there. Seriously, I know hundreds of Nigerian accountants are coming to my hometown for this spectacular event and we can't wait for your arrival. For those of you who do, sustainability is a key World Congress theme. It matters to the entire global family. And for those of you who can't, the World Congress will keep you posted on all events and many are being live streamed. So please take that opportunity to see what's happening. Another quote from your lead paper. 
The commonwealth of the country has been pillaged by a few, thereby creating a sense of economic insecurity for the average Nigerian. Fraud and corruption is a global issue, and technology is making it faster and harder to track. At the global level across several fronts, IFAC supports your fight. At the OECD and B20, the advisory arm of the G20 nations, IFAC has been advising global leaders that accountants are ready and willing to use their skills to fight fraud and corruption. But we also champion a view that this fight, we can't win it alone. We have been fighting and we need to work with others to share our passion for transparency, accountability and good governance. Last year, IFAC launched a study that confirms the profession's major positive role in reducing corruption. It was conducted independently by the Centre for Economics and Business Research. The study revealed that a higher percentage of accountants in the workforce strongly correlates with better outcomes in the Transparency International Global Corruption Perception Index. Crucially, the study showed that our role was enhanced when we work within effective national governance architectures in partnership with good government and a strong public sector. <coughs> Me. The study confirmed that accountants, professional ethics, education and oversight are a key to this success. But meaningful progress in this age-old fight will require three things. One, continued strong cross-sector collaboration. Secondly, a reinvigorated international interest in public financial management. And finally, greater adoption of the high-quality international standards on financial reporting, auditing and ethics. To reinforce the message of this cross-sector collaboration, this year IFAC cemented its professional friendship and engagement with the International Bar Association. And they were with us in Argentina when I presented our findings at the B20 Forum. And it was extremely powerful <coughs> to have both the lawyers and the accountants there together in one voice. And we also committed to working with each other to explore other practical measures to assist the fight and defend the public interest. Of course, at the national level, ICANN's partnership with the Nigerian Bar Association is an excellent move. And working together with lawyers to fight corruption and promote integrity in public institutions and business is an active way to defend the public interest. It's clear that intentional measures, political will, and diligence by a variety of actors is also required if we are to achieve sound public financial management. Our fact strongly supports the adoption and implementation of a cool based international public sector accounting standards. It's key to transforming the global public sector transparency and accountability. Delving down to the regional level, level I want to highlight Parfa's commitment to better fight for public financial management and to fight corruption. Last year, Dixon Nakube, Harper's CEO, wrote an outstanding article for IFAC's Global Knowledge Gateway. It was, entitled, it was titled, When Corruption Becomes a Way of Life and What to Do About It. He wrote, African society is drowning in have-all-possess-all mentality that has become an endless orgy of spend and gain. Position and power have become keys to accessing resources meant for the general good and converting them for private good. We will be forgiven for concluding that the scrambles we see for power on our continent are no longer driven by desire to serve, by, but by waiting, turns to loot. We need to simplify the message about corruption so that every citizen, regardless of their level of education, can understand it and its negative impact on their own lives. Corruption must be elevated to the level of criminality that it is, a crime against humanity. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an African accountant speaking to truth, power and the public interest. And please don't think that I'm an Australian coming to Africa to tell you about your country. I could have lifted those very words and applied it to my own and to many other countries around the world. Dixon's words are very important for all of us as global accountants to reflect on what's happening in our own communities. 
At the global level, another IFAC initiative to support the worldwide profession is a partnership with the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. Together, we are developing the International Public Sector Financial Accountability Index. The index will provide a comprehensive global picture of financial reporting and budgeting frameworks used by governments. We believe the index will help assess the current and future state of public finances and spark further conversation on public financial management efforts. Here in Nigeria, ICANN is once again showing the way in the creation of its own accountability index. And I've met some of the key players here today involved in that and I commend the work that's been done. Federal, state and local governments are going to be held to account for the quality of their financial reporting practices. ICANN will release rankings that will show organize, that which organisations are performing the best and also those that are not performing so well. <coughs> Ask President Zakari, I could find no better way to do justice to this initiative than to quote your words at the launch of this program. We are not presenting the Accountability Index to government. We didn't do it for government. We did it for Nigeria. We are doing it for the public. I commend your work, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, that's a great example of both speaking out in the public interest and acting intentionally to defend the bold and innovative thinking. And here's another way of ICANN's dynamic thinking. Having already signed up the lawyers to help support fraud and corruption, I can extend the support to the police academy to train young police men and women on financial crimes investigations. <clears throat> I congratulate I can again for its foresight. The Forensic Accounting Research Centre is inspired thinking. <clears throat> forensic accounting is important globally and its importance is a growing one as is the focus on financial crime. In my day job, artificial intelligence has revealed remarkable opportunities to increase my team's satisfaction. But technology also brings great risk. So we need to focus on that. Personal information theft can lead to significant value destruction, but worse is the impact of reputational loss, lower revenues because once loyal clients don't return, and another level, the catastrophic effect of ransomware attacks. These people now have their own call centres to take payment to unlock your company's service. There is no doubt that technology is going to enable our profession to scale new heights, but we must focus on it as well and to protect both our own data and that of our clients. Finally, I turn once again to the lead paper. As a people, our collective existence and the welfare of future generations are challenged. Professional accountants, by our public interest mandate, are eminently positioned to champion the birth of a new Nigeria. The Panama Papers released in 2016 illustrated the disastrous management of many state-owned enterprises. Opaque financial management systems, limited oversight and restricted auditing procedures were only part of the problem. This problem is cultural and is found in every country in the world. But the good news is that the global accountancy profession offers bold, innovative thinking and solutions. We are actively seeking and working with partners who share our values, admire our ethics and value our skills, and from whom we can also learn. The fight for a stronger, more transparent, sustainable global economy can be found in IFAC's strategy, build trust, inspire confidence. In the solutions provided by G20 Call to Action, in our representations to the OECD, the B20, and other multilateral institutions, and at the World Congress of Accountants, which is held every four years. The fight for a stronger, more transparent and sustainable Africa can be found in part of strategy, building a bridge to a brighter Africa. In the experiences shared at the African Congress of Accountants, held every two years, and in the words of its CEO, in order to promote integrity, defeat corruption, all of society needs to work together. And the fight for a stronger, more transparent, sustainable Nigeria can be found in your actions and deeds. Beyond its accountability index, police academy partnership, and its support for education and training, this is an institute that launched a whistleblower's fund in 2015 to protect and compensate members who reported financial regularities. 
encouraged the government to enact last year's Whistleblower Protection Act, adopted NOFAR last year, the International Ethics Board standards that mandates professional accountants report suspected non-compliance with laws and standards, it backs the stronger corporate governance standards and speaks out regularly on the need for better budget management. And best of all, ICANN does it all for a better Nigeria in the public interest. And this should make you proud to be an ICANN member and proud, and proud to be part of the profession that offers deep thinking and bold solutions to answer the challenge. The rest of the world and IFAC has a lot to learn from ICANN. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to attempt to speak after the IFAC president, uh, even though I know she's covered some of my points in her paper. But there seems to be some sort of convergence between the things I want to say from a local point of view, why she's been talking about from a global point of view. You know, one of the key challenges uh, we have in Nigeria is that we know that we're endowed with resources. We know that we have not just fiscal resources, but we have tremendous human capital. And in my, in my night job, which is you know, overseeing um, uh, keeping in Africa, so my day job is actually in Nigeria, uh, I transcend the continent. And I see that, in fact, when it comes to human capital, that we are leader in, in this space in, in Africa. And, and we don't, we don't, we're not using it to our advantage in our country. And I'll come back to that point later on. The next you know, critical issue for me, of course, is that around our politics. Governance, uh, leadership, uh, possible for resources, um, you know, all of these are content uh, and nation's you know, uh, pace of social and, and economic development. You know, 15, 20 years ago, the economists uh, wrote an article about the alignment between democracy and development. I was preaching that democracy would drive development in a much faster mode and environment. I was in Singapore two weeks ago uh, for a global partners conference, and that's a country that in 35 years has become one of the most wealthiest countries uh, in the world today, from a country that was just full of marshlands and has absolutely no natural resources except for human capital. And yet they, they, are, they had their own kind of democracy. They had a, a, a global prime minister for uh, something years, and his son is not prime minister, but the country runs, absolutely, and the people of the country are very happy with what they've achieved. So the commonwealth of our country has been pledged by a few, they have created a sense of economic security for the average Nigerian. Because everybody is angry to exploit, all we want to do is exploit, we want to exploit the resources that we have, um, we don't want to regenerate, you know, um, but however, I can't one institution that can sell for, for free, that has done an excellent job in its regeneration over the years. So, to carry out the commons, let's give it a try out what is our quality security. Our government systems, as well as our political system of any nation, are key drivers of economic growth and development. So they, are, they, are, they work hand in hand. However, our national government uh, lasts collective responsibility and has adversely affected the rate of economic growth. We are a country where we need to grow double digits per annum. If you grow this economy at 10% per annum, in six years, compounded, you will double your GDP. Even if you grow at 6% per annum, in 10 years, compounded, you double your GDP. Indonesia is a population of 20 million people, or 50 million people, with an economy of 1 trillion dollars. There's no reason why in Nigeria, if we do what we need to do over the next 6 to 10 years, we can actually double our GDP. And you know, it is cost significantly. So what's our role as a What exactly should we aspire uh, to do? To serve the private sector? Or, and if we serve the private sector, who constitutes government? Who runs government? As you heard from the other speaker, the private sector cannot exist without the flourishing public sector. What else? What are the has contributed to our economic political social growth of Nigeria? I can have been part of the Nigerian society for more than 50 years. Today, in the Nigerian cabinet, I'm not saying it's the best cabinet, but say, just as an example, there are seven senior lawyers in that cabinet. 
So there's no legal issue that this country will discuss at cabinet meeting. Because lawyers have contributed to what is that kind? How are we going to play not only to the federal government, but also the state government and local governments? And what are we going to contribute to the economic, to the economic growth to the of this country? What public value should accountants, the economic professional deliver is to create a shared future. Now, there's a survey that was done a few, a few years ago, despite this at 2011. It was done by the International Survey by the um, by ACCA among CFOs, accountants, directors, uh, equivalent across 20 countries on their views on what public value it should be delivered by the accounting account profession and how it could be enhanced. There are almost 100 cash cards. Interestingly, there are 300 cash cards from Africa who actually participated in this survey. 30% of the respondents listed the accounting profession as number two to the medical profession. The medical profession has much more significant public value than the accounting profession. But there are five factors to be identified as the corner for the global accounting profession to conclude public value. The first one is ethical conduct. The second one is openness and transparency. The third is social and economic development. The fourth is cultural regulations. And the last is governance. And I'll, I'll talk to those five topics very quickly. Ethical conduct, first of all. As a council, what we need to do, we need to act diligently and in accordance with applicable technical and professional standards from providing professional services. We need to be independent in mind, not allowing professional political and business development to be written by bias, compromise, and a flex. On paper, easy to say. In reality, very, very difficult. Whether you're an accountant in, in the profession, or you're an accountant in industry, whether you're a CFO or a finance director. If you're a company, you're a company where governance is not top class, and the board decides to do something else to go to the business of that company, and you're the finance director, and you, you say no. What happens to you? You may do the job. So, are you willing to be compromised? Or are you willing to say, sorry, because of my profession, I stand on it, and I will not do what you want me to do, and if you want me to do what I'll do, I'll report you to the, to the authorities. How many contacts in this room can say they can do that? In our profession, clients put us under pressure to say, this is what I want to do this at my purpose, this is what I want to do in my accounts. You must be ready to walk away from that client and say, fine, sorry, it's a different question, I won't do it. But the reality is, how many accountants today can do that? Because that client is the key client of your pay fees, you do pay salaries. Secondly, social and economic development. I can have an essential role to play in the order of of custom global professional and ethical standards, in promoting good governance and supporting the global development in the country. Again, look around us in our environment. We have a, a philosophy in my, in my, in my firm <coughs> that good corporate governance means that can the board fire the CEO? Will they find the CEO not to have done what you have done? And any company where we believe the board cannot fire the CEO and just happen in Nigeria, we will not work for that company. I remember very well when, when the, the previous Senator Governor decided to take over some banks, some nine banks. And if you go back and look closely at those nine banks that are taken over, most of them fell fail that question. Their boss could not fire the CEO. How many more do we have today? Not just in country, but, but across corporate Nigeria. Financial regulations. We need a higher level of advocacy in financial prudence, disclosure, and accountability stewardship. This will value for money. Efficient and effective resource organization and how we have to represent the activity of the business. When I started my career 36 years ago, I would produce a final report of a, of a public company. It was the matter? 30 or 40 pages. Today, the annual report of, of public companies are 300, 400 pages. And yet, the shareholders understand those uh, annual reports. We give them so much information, and yet, what happens? When they get to ATMs, they complain they haven't seen X, Y, Z, or they, they, they don't understand why they don't give them. The third point is openness and transparency. We need to adopt corporate transparency to show us of institutions regarding matters that protect their interests as the basic ingredient of the limited image of our profession in Nigeria. So, as a company, we must do to stand up in the corporate environment. 
the few that things are not being done in the interest of shareholders, we must be able to say so. And finally, governance. I can examine the government for corporate governance and the central which can report themselves in the need of corporate governance for the benefit of a wide range of stakeholders and the benefit of society in general. You, and you're very surprised that even on the board level, at board level, there are many board members who don't understand financial reporting, who don't understand the link between financial reporting and corporate governance. I have gone to IOD to, to, to lecture, and lecture the fall and put uh, this in the for corporate governance. And you, you, the, the amount of financial illiteracy on corporate boards is, is, you know, is scary. Don't even talk about public sector. The private sector, you know, is, I can talk about the public sector, there's probably very little knowledge of financial reports in the public sector, if anything at all. So that question by a public, by a public interest candidate, and anything who's going to champion a faster rate of growth for the economy, and in three dimensions. First of all, service in public office. You know, we need to provide relevant skills and training to reach the our government to execute the agenda. We also need to encourage political accountants to actually go into the public service, you know, to serve our country. You know, I have a part of mine who is in the cabinet in Lagos State, for example. You know, we have you know, uh, colleagues who are governors of the number of states in, in the country. We don't have enough of us who are in, in public service. We need to hold public officers accountable. You know, we need to, like this, this will be, you can assist government in developing various initiatives that enable them in order to express their accountability of their roles. For example, federal and state governments, we should hold them accountable to producing the budget before 31 December. Since 1999, there's only been two instances where the federal government budget has been passed upon before 31 December. Read, debated the National Assembly and passed by the National Assembly and signed by the President before 31 December. Only two occasions in how many years now? In 19 years. I don't, I don't even know what it is in, in, in state governments. We need to have regular feedback by our federal government in terms of you know, how is the budget performing against actual. What are they doing with the money that they are collecting from us? Either as cash money, as cash money or, or, or other money. We also need to prove government to spend a high proportion of, of their spending on capital expenditure. Because the only way you can grow an economy is to invest in, in, in fiscal performance. The way we are going, capital is spending on the current and the current expenditure, and there are significant delays in procurement processes for capital expenditure. Unfortunately, the economy is going into a vast decline. Even if you are growing at 1 or 2 percent per annum and population is growing at 2 to 1 percent, you have negative economic growth. And if you continue at that rate, our economy is going to be shrinking over the next few years. We need to build sustainable institutions. I can need to offer to review the budget process for much more effectiveness and much more relevance to people and government business standards and needs of the people. Um, you know, think about it. People sitting in Abuja and come with the budgets for, for health or education. And have had a budget has no bearing at all with the needs of people in my local government, for example. I can show up with the account general to construct the vision of, of ISAS for federal state and state and local governments. I can show support capacity building on the role of federal accountants and three separate government. In other words, what should a federal government be doing in government? What is the role that we should play in government? How can we enhance financial openness and transparency while in government? It's not just for us to go to government and say these are the simple procedures, but we should go to government and say, let's improve on these procedures. Let's make them much more transparent and much more open. So how prepared is that account for the future of the government of Nigeria? How do you bridge the human capital gaps of today to ensure you have the skills and competencies required for the future? We are in the fourth industrial revolution. Are we producing internal companies that are operating in the fourth industrial revolution? How do we ensure an efficient set of plan that the futuristic can take into account the requirements of government, governance, economic development, science and technology? I have a quote here from the from local president, Jim Kim. He says, human capital is about 65% of the world in the high income countries, and only 40% in the low income countries. Low income countries need to overcome this, and there is a sense of urgency. Not only because we are facing several current human capital crises, also because of acceleration of technology. We require countries to constantly invest in their people, if they hope to compete in the economy of the future. 
And let me tell you one, one drawback about that, that comment, that, that point in Nigeria. If we don't invest in human capital, so that we can become more competitive, and we make the economy grow as fast enough for those skills to be we are going to be producing human capital for other countries. I understand, for example, to, to, today, average of 15 qualified doctors in Nigeria, either to UK or Canada, every week. Every week, they are great. There are some countries, for example, that made their borders very open to professionals. For example, I have probably 10 or 12 qualified accountants that train here in Lagos who work in the China Islands in the UK. All they do is go online, apply, do a Skype interview, they get their work permit on the of the employer, get it, and they answer that, and they've left the country. So the more we do this human capital development, without allowing the human capital to be useful to our economy, we produce talent for other, other countries. The world has transitioned to the fourth industrial revolution. And believe it, you know, right from the time of you know, mechanization, steam and water power, to mass production electricity, to electronic and health systems automation, we now have cyber physical systems. And we are using it every day, all of us. But mobile phone is going to you know, be continued. You know, going online to buy a health systems, going online to Jumia or to, or to, to buy something, or even for Amazon, you know. There's so many back office systems today that are done by AI and not human beings. And we all use them today. You're know, using your, your credit card, your debit card, in, you know, for, for, for transactions. So it's here today. And it's, it's going to be on the increase. So you better believe it. So, a person in market development class for the kind of profession, therefore requires an understanding of three skill areas. Skills required today, given the structure of the US economy. Skills required for the future, given by drivers for change and mega trends, and professional skills requires to reverse the high level of poverty in our country. In conclusion, to secure our shared future cannot but be a collective responsibility of all of us in this room, and many of us who are outside this room. As well as we must build trust in society and government, we must discredit political societies and really restore the ecosystem to enable us to achieve the UN's goal of having a sustainable development as a history of the present without compromising the ability of three generations to meet their needs. Many of us in this room, our own our forefathers and parents, sacrificed for us to get the education we have and to give us the exposure we have. We have a responsibility to do so for generations to come. Thank you very much. So you will agree with me that we've had a lot of food for, for thought, and I would like you to uh, give a hand of applause to our presenter. Uh, and to me, because it's called your And so right. <laughs> so I have time for two questions. Good morning, sir, Chairman. All protocols duly observed. My name is Kutsi Oluwaro Tini Akiriola S18447. My question this morning is to ask whether Nigeria is changed. Why? We said that accountants are best suited to help in securing our shared future. When you look at, when you look at our political space today, or in the past few years, we have been privileged to have members of this highly referred profession who find important posts, either as the accountants uh, of federal of tradition, either as a uh, head of service of the Federation, either as governors, either as ministers. But that that's a law, you look back and see that their performance, or the legacy left behind, is nothing to write home about. Question. So my question is, 
how can we, as chartered accountants, help those who are privileged to be uh, in the public space to perform better than other professions that we have identified because other professions have failed to us. And chartered accountants are equally Thank you. I'd like to start on the protocol. My name is Bukola Akimoladu, FCA membership number 5947. With the advent of um, artificial intelligence, which the IFA president makes uh, mention of doing her speech, I'd like to know what efforts both IFA and um, various um, professional accounting bodies are making to ensure that there's a convergence between our profession and the technical the IT world so that we we'll make sure that our our profession does not go, go into education. We need to be capacity. What effort are we making to ensure that capacity is not just built but it's also developed? Thank you. Last question. Yes. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, let me add on all existing uh, protocol. My name is Tony Mike Aibi. My number is 15545. Every science research actually shows that um, our profession is one of the threatened profession in the next five to ten years. So my question is this. How do we bridge the gap between our reality now and the expectation of the future. We talked about the future. And um, I want to make reference to Mr. Kole's presentation. I was expecting an aspect of technology. How do we align, how do we unless the opportunity that technology is bringing to our profession? Bearing in mind that manner we are thinking is out of place, and a lot of expectation is placed on both the accountant and the auditor, and the period of second of our profession. Thank you. Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to take questions two and three. Uh, this is my first time to Nigeria, so I can't tell you how it's changed the question one, so I'll let my peers do that. But, in relation to that excellent question and the question on technology, I asked the graduate class that works with me how many of their grandparents or parents had said, don't go into the profession of accounting because robots will take your space. 100% put up their hands. And I disagree. And I guess one of the proudest things of my ISAC presidency has been to establish the technology advisory group where I handpick people from all over the world, including Tanzania, from one of the, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank. And all over the world. ICAW has been a key part of this, ACCA, Canada, I've represented Australia. And we broke it down into five things. And I think these are the new A, B, C, D, E. And we figured that this is where accountants can really play. A for artificial intelligence with a subset of robotics. B for blockchain. C for cyber security. C also is the underlying part is communication. Because it's the communication to our clients, to our customers, to our businesses that will continue to set accounts apart. Part D is data and data analytics. And the E is for ethics. And this is crucial. As I have just, as I said to you earlier, put in eight lots of robotics to change the lives of some of the accountants. Some of the people in my team had to come in at 8 o'clock in the morning and press a button and go away for two hours and then come back and could do their job while things were processed. The, ro the robot does that now. Those people leave two hours earlier to get home to their families, they're much happier. So robots aren't going to take their place. It's about how to work smarter with technology. And we believe those five things we are trying to get out to all our member bodies to educate all the three million accountants around the world to assist. 
The big four accounting firms have all worked very hard and love for the technology to be all up to date. I can tell you in my bank there's some technology that's older than me. It's true. And, uh, and therefore a lot of things will be done manually. So we've sort of got a two-speed economy that we need to look at in regards to technology. But IFAC is passionate about this and if you have a look on the Gateway IFAC website and have a look at some of the great conversations we've had with leaders around the world on these topics, from IBM, from the Microsoft, from the Oracles, please have a look at that and I think that will really give you an understanding. But I think accountants can lead in that space and be extremely helpful and I hope those tools are helpful to you. Very classic in terms of the answer to you, some of your questions. The first one was how do we have our colleagues who go to the public space? In my firm, we've had a number of our colleagues who decide to go to the public space, either directly from my firm or later on, many years later, in, in other career positions. Um, I have two cases now one in, in the state government, where one of my partners is a commissioner. And we seconded one of our managers to work with him full time for, the, for the three, four years he's there as a coach. Because apart from that, he has to learn the public sector's way of doing things. He also needed some, somebody who had a lot more higher level of attitude and skill level to be able to analyze some of the difficult uh, issues he's facing in his role as a commissioner. We also have a colleague uh, who's a lawyer of the who's a minister today. Um, and he's not, he's not in finance because he's one of the, one of the, one of the key ministries that supplies it to the economy. I seconded a director full time for four years, working with our minister. I seconded the manager, you know, the, uh, what they call it, officer Pedek, which is doing, doing, uh, uh, the, doing, doing business in Nigeria in this team. I have a manager there, seconded, uh, now, now, now two years. Yeah, some of these uh, roles will be at the cost of those individuals. And because that's the only way that we believe those people are our best colleagues and can be successful. If we had much more resources, we would even do more than that. But that's the very thing that we can do at this point in time. Because there are people who live well in our firm and we believe that we support them in, and encourage them in their goals. The other thing also is that when our colleagues go into to, to government, whether it's into the state or the executive, many of them don't know what to expect. They haven't been there before. Some of us have had the luxury of working even for you know for college future or working for executive. And we've seen the inside of how those things operate. And we can even give them ideas as to what to do to, um, to improve. I'll give you one example. So a, a, a friend of mine who is an ex-cracker was very concept in one of these key ministries, very large ministry. And uh, when he resumed the concept, they gave him the organogram for the ministry. But we had done also worked in that ministry over the years, almost a hundred page documents describing the ministry and the organograms. And he said to me, he said, well, the organograms they gave to me didn't have all the functions you gave to me in your own documents. Which means that they were hiding some functions from me as the concept. I said, they will now, because you don't know this system. You're expected to pick up later. So, it is a, it's a very difficult task when you go into the coffee space. And it doesn't mean you will succeed. But if you go there with the mindset that you want to focus on succeed, you will succeed. Because the easiest thing they do there is they don't have to distract you. You must go there with a plan, go there with an agenda, and make sure that every single day you are focused on your agenda. If not, you get distracted. So, talk about, I think the question on the uh, AI was addressed by the ICAR president. The last point about having a the gap between today and tomorrow. Again, let me be very classic about that. One of the things we decided to do uh, a few months, a couple of months ago, and we are still in the process of doing so, is that we decided as a firm to approach, you know, small and medium-sized practices in Nigeria. Um, so long as you don't have, that firm doesn't have any international affiliation, we are running a program where we are asking, you know, owners of small firms to second one or two of their staff to my firm, take them for one year. Okay? We will show that. We will train them at no cost to the class. We pay the salary for that one year, so that they are off your payroll for that one year, okay? And we will give them all the exposure they will get to work in, in an IT-driven environment for one year. 
to work on appliances. Most people in the office will take them to clients. To work on appliances, use our tools, learn our tools, get shaped for one year. Full salary. Okay? What we will not do, we will not push any of them. We will not employ any of them after that one year. We will expect all of them to go back to their parents that are coming to come to us. Okay? It's not automatic because we need to sell the candidates. We want to have a level playing field. We're going to have split the candidates. Some will reject, some will, and some will accept. Okay? So if you don't need to be we will accept them. Once you get a standard, we take on for a year. Now, once you go back to it, those small firms, the middle class firms, our expectation is that they will go back with better skills, better knowledge, better experience, and inform the small company that you have to invest. You have to invest. So, when we come back to the big team, Today and the future, one of the big differences about the future is investment. Invest in human capital, invest in IT systems, invest in things you need to improve the service you to your clients. We shall not put any of them at all. We have up to our AC spaces. We can apply up to each of these people for the next 12 months. So if you haven't, if you don't know about the program yet, you can contact me through ICANN, you have my email address. I will, will screen the candidates for any of the funds that are here. So long as your fund has no international affiliation. If you do, we have got that the financial affiliation should give you what you're looking for. If they're not giving you what you're looking for, then it's, it's complete paper affiliation. Okay. Yeah. But that's the truth. So if you wish to be it today and in the future, you have to invest very heavily in people. You know, and to invest in people as well, you must train them, you must expose them and do so. We have another scheme, what we are doing now with one of the investors. Backup University. We take credit from Backup University. Into our firm, for 12 months, those people who are almost qualified, who do the accounting with uh, degree, who almost finish the ICC or ICANN, or uh, ICANN for us, is our own uh, preference. And for one year, they go through just taking ICANN, ICANN lectures and ICANN exams. Don't do any work at all. We pay them salary. End of 12 months, they will qualify. If they are qualified, they then start working on clients. So we're doing different things now in this way because all of us have a collective responsibility to be able to deliver the future we want us in this country. We can't wait to go into our position in the future. Thank you. There was a novelist who said that different races, different tribes, they have had separate area of separate estates has run its course. So we have a shared future, economic, political, and even in terms of uh, development. But this future cannot be taken for granted. It has to be secured. And I think the summary of the presentation today is that we have to do it together. Thank you very much for this. Stay.